Father, we just thank you today, Jesus Christ. Thank you, Father, for giving us another day of life, Father. Thank you, Jesus Christ, for, God, you're just so good. You know, regardless of anything that we got going on in our life, Lord, how could we say that you're not good, Lord, that you're on the throne, Father? You're a holy God. You're a righteous God. Father, you're worth serving, Father God. We've served so many things in our life, Lord. You're the only thing worth serving. You're the only person worth living for and dying for, Father. So today we just thank you. I praise your name, Lord. I exalt your name. And I just say thank you, Jesus, for giving me another day, another chance, Father, to, to live for you, to get things done right. Maybe yesterday we didn't do things the, the best way, but today you gave us another shot. So to make things right today. So, Father, we thank you for that today. Today, Lord, we're just gathering together, Lord, to, to learn your word, to get an understanding of, of who you are, Father, because your word is who you are. How can we say we love you, Father, but yet we don't care to know you, to know what you like, what you don't like, how you are, what you expect of us, Father. So today, Jesus, let this word, uh, let it change us, Father God. Let it encourage us. Let it strengthen us. Let it give us wisdom. So, Father, this word that we know, it's not just some message we hear and we forget what we learn and what we heard, that every verse we read, that we can memorize it, Father God. Because Satan has so much ammunition sometimes against us, Father. And we, the best ammunition I have, Lord, is the, the ammunition that is the verses that we use in defending ourselves, Father. Without your word, we can't do nothing. Your word says, Father, that your word itself is our sort of our spirit, the spirit, Father God. How can we fight? if we don't know your word. So that's why we have this Bible study. So we can know what your word is means, what it what you, what it says, Father God. So it can be revealed to us, Father. Every person that's on here, if it's their first time or their millionth time being on here, let today let it be a fresh anointing, a fresh feeling, fresh understanding. Give people ears to hear, eyes to see. Give them a mind that can comprehend, Father God, uh, this message, Father God. But above all, that Father, we can't comprehend none of this if we don't have your Holy Spirit, Lord. So, Holy Spirit, we ask that you would help us in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Just want to welcome everybody. I see a couple of names here I haven't seen here before. Just want to welcome Terry. Who else we got on here that hasn't been here before? Everyone's the usual, right? <laughs> Amen. Amen. Let's get this thing started. Like I said, hope everybody was having a good week. This message is supremely important today, right? Because one, it's God's words. Every word he has is supremely important, regardless of the topic, right? But everything that's in God's word is important. Uh, so the message that the Lord gave me is called debased mind or slash reprobate mind versus having a sound mind and i think this topic is super important because i don't know about you guys but i don't recall years ago everyone having a mental health issue right everybody claims now they have a mental health issue and they probably do right and and it's so important because god wants us to have a sound mind and we sometimes we think we know what that is, but I don't think we really search the scriptures and truly know what that means. And even if we know what that means, actually, like, live it out and say, like, OK, like, I have a sound mind and I'm trying to keep a sound mind. Sometimes our thoughts, they run wild, you know, and it's so important that we have a sound mind because the Bible says that our thoughts run our life. Did you guys know that that our thoughts run? Uh, uh, babe, can you send the right link to Ford or respond to it? Um, so it's it, so our, our like I said, so our thoughts run our life. So if our, the Bible says that our thoughts run our life, that means that whatever we're thinking about, whatever's going in on our mind, it can control the course of our life. And when we think about it, it's like wow, like my mind is that powerful so if our mind is that powerful then we know we got to know how to use it right we got to know how to control it right we got to know how to use it because it's a weapon that we you that we we use or it's a weapon that could be used against us and more than ever everybody like i said has a some kind of mental health 
depression uh, the the enemy re constantly reminds people of their past and their failures so they don't ever go forward in life because they're living in their past and their mind uh, they struggle with fear doubts worry maybe they struggle with temptation all day long and these things drive people crazy right and you your mind goes crazy and the, like I said, so the Lord gave me this word, the reprobate mind versus a sound mind, because as we're living in the last days, Jesus said that in the last days, because of how men would live their lives, people's minds would be handed over to a reprobate mind. So we got to know what that means. I, I, I touched it real quick on Sunday, but a, a lot of people didn't know what that meant. So it was very important that we talk about this because you're going to see this more than ever in the, in the history of the world. Is it a multiple people with a reprobate mind, multiple people with a reprobate mind. So we're going to get into it. What is that? What does that mean? And like I said, and it's so important that we know what this means. So we don't fall into that because I believe if you're on this Bible study today, clearly you don't have a reprobate mind. If you had a reprobate mind, Trust me, you wouldn't be on here, much less listening to the way that I preach. You would trust me, you wouldn't be on here. So if you're on here worrying, I think I have a reprobate mind. Trust me, you wouldn't be on. You wouldn't be on here. But it's a warning, so you don't go in that direction. See, a reprobate mind doesn't happen overnight. That's not like I had a bad day, had bad thoughts, and overnight I, now I have a reprobate mind. No, that's something that gets built up through time, right? And just like having a sound mind, you have to train your mind because, like I said, who here doesn't get attacked in their mind? I do. <laughs> Every We all get attacked in our mind. Uh, the enemy lies to us. He tricks us. Um, he creates illusions, like I said, in our, in, in our mind and all kinds of different things. Uh, reminds us of our past. Uh, maybe sometimes makes us look into things way too deep. Have, have you ever met somebody like that? That everything they look into it so deep. It's like, bro, it's not that deep. Uh, has any, has anyone, um, like I said, ha has met somebody like that? It's because, like I said, it's because we need to start being careful and start guarding our mind and start protecting our mind. Our mind also has to get delivered and secured. And that's why I said this topic is so important: reprobate mind versus having a sound mind. Like I said, because in today's world, like I said, there's a such a huge surge of mental health issues. Uh, like I said, people who more and more have less God in their minds uh, and reject God or say they or like like this is the craziest thing that a lot of people that that proclaim. That they have God and that they love God, um, like I said, but then you you bring scriptures to them, you, know, you bring the word of God to them, and it's they their brain won't comprehend it or they reject it. Better yet, they reject it. Have you ever met somebody like that? You bring them the scriptures, they say they're a believer, they say they're a Christian, and their mind is just completely rejects it. Like I said, or they say, I love Jesus, I, I'm a Christian, but their lifestyle contradicts completely what they say they believe because like i said it's easy for anybody to say i am a christian yes i believe in jesus but you got to ask yourself does your life represent that do your actions represent that because the bible says by their fruits you shall know them it doesn't say by your words what you call yourself it's what kind of life do you live that people can say you're a christian right so Jesus said, my people please me with their lips, but their hearts are far from it. That means we can say it, right? And we can quote the scriptures. You can make the Facebook post, the Instagram stories. You can put the verses in your bio. But where is your heart at, right? And these things are so important, like I said, because the two most important things that I believe a Christian needs to be guarding is their mind and their heart. Why? Because I don't want to go into the heart because that's not what it's about today. But the Bible says the heart is the most deceitful of all things. Says so don't trust it. And the mind is where the enemy attacks us, right? The mind is where the devil attacks us and, and has a field day with us sometimes. And when we allow those things to happen for a long time, 
what happens is eventually you can be handed over to a reprobate mind. Like I said, I'm going to explain what that means. But like I said, this is why this is so important, because if we don't take control and start have walking with a sound mind, what does that mean to have the mind of Christ? Your mind could be handed over if we don't do something about it. So what's a debased or reprobate mind? The definition that I wrote here with a couple of definitions that I found. A debased or reprobate mind is one whose mind and thought process has been given over or handed over to think in a godless way, having no understanding or conception of spiritual things due to them hardening their hearts towards God in the first place, which starts from a person who willfully sins over and over again. So basically, it's a person whose mind is now has become blocked to the things of God. That's a person, like I said, that you can talk to them about God. It doesn't it doesn't touch them. It doesn't change them. You tell them, let's go to church. There's no fear of God. There's no urge. There's no urgency to go to church. That's either a person who has a reprobate mind or they're heading in that direction. You've hardened your heart towards God, that you feel that certain things of God, certain verses are not important they're of no need to you and your mind has tricked you into believing that and you can confront that person all you want but their brain will not allow them to comprehend because their mind by god himself has handed their mind over to a reprobate mind how does that happen that doesn't happen overnight that comes from a lifestyle that's why it's so important that that's why we preach holiness that's why we preach that you need to live a righteous life, that you need to do your best that you can to live for Jesus. I'm not saying you'll never make a mistake. I'm not saying that um, uh, you're not going to go through different things. It's that um, it, it's the certain, the, the, it's, how would I say it? It's the mindset that you have that, that you, that, that, that's so important in your walk with Christ. What kind of like when you wake up in the morning, what is your mindset on doing today? It's like, how can I please Jesus? How can I live for Jesus? Who can I talk to Jesus about Jesus to today? Like, you have to have a mindset of Christ. You got to be in. I always tell people, you got to be intentional with your walk with Christ. Don't be casual. Just like people who try to casually spend time with God. Guess what? You'll, you're not going to spend time with God. A week, two weeks go by and you're like, you're realizing I haven't really spent time with the Lord. You have to be intentional. So you have to be intentional with your mindset. Because if you just let your minds go with the wind, your minds is going to betray you. It's going to be used against you. And the devil's going to use that as his playground to attack you. And that's why people, through time, see, you don't get depressed from one day to another. That comes through time of you allowing the enemy in. You don't get anxiety from one day to the other. That's through time that you've allowed anxiety little by little, little by little. And then and now it's little by little has overwhelmed you to the point you have such a hard time defeating it because you've let it in so much throughout time. This ain't, this isn't an overnight thing. And that's why it's so important that we live, like I said, our life a certain way. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 26 to 27 talks about this. It says, for if we willfully, if we sin willfully after we have received the knowledge of the truth, there no longer remains a sacrifice for sins you know how we like i always quote this verse because a lot of people don't quote this scripture everyone says yes jesus forgives all your sin yes he does but it's how you go about it that may get you not forgiven because here it says if you willfully continue to sin that's the person that i'm just going to keep doing this and i know it's wrong i'll just keep asking god for forgiveness that's when you willfully sin. That's not like, man, somebody, you know, cut me off and I got in my flesh and I, I, I fell. This is somebody, like I said, that is like, I'm going to do this, right? I'm going to sleep with this girl. I'm going to sleep with this guy. I know the Bible says it's fornication and to do second, I'm, and I'm going to do it anyways. And I just know God died for my sin, so he'll forgive me anyways. Like, and you, you're intentional with it. It says here, if you do this, after you have received the knowledge of truth, meaning you know 
what the truth says, it says there's no longer a sacrifice for you. That means there's no longer Jesus forgive me and he forgives you. There's none of it. it this isn't me making this up. It says here, if you, uh, you willfully continue to keep sinning after you've received the knowledge of truth, there no longer remains a sacrifice for sins, but a certain fearful expectation of judgment and fiery indignation, which will devour the adversaries. So let's look at this. So that's how you end up with a reprobate mind. It's when you continually live a willful, sinful life after having received the knowledge of truth, meaning you know the truth of Jesus, and you say, I'm just going to keep going to the club. I'm going to just keep smoking. I'm going to just keep doing drugs. I'm going to just keep sleeping around. I'm going to just keep cursing and listening to this worldly music. If I keep doing these things, I know you guys are probably going to say, Jamie, you're going too hard. Oh, this you're just too religious. That's too much. Listen, if script, that's, see, that's the new generation of a reprobate mindset. You quote scriptures, you're called religious, right? It's like, if you quote a verse to somebody, oh, you're being religious. That's the Bible. <laughs> the Bible says that God is his word and the word is God. So if I'm quoting what God says, you're calling that religious. That's the reprobate mindset. That's the reprobate mindset that you start quoting a verse and somebody calls you religious, right? So let's look at what a reprobate mind is. Romans chapter one, verse 20 to 32. Romans chapter one, verse 20 to 32. It says, for since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. Because although they knew God, did they not glorify him as God? So th this is how it's starting <laughs> about reprobate mind. It says, even though they knew God, they didn't glorify him as God. These are people who say, I'm a Christian. I know Jesus. I know this and blah, blah, blah. But that question is, you say you know him, but do you live a life glorifying him? Is their question. Let's continue. It says, uh, nor were thankful, but became futile in their thoughts. That means you become futile. That means you're letting your mind just think and do whatever it wants. And their foolish hearts were darkened, professing to be wise. They became fools and changed the glory of incor incorruptible God of the uncorruptible God into an image made like corruptible man. What does that mean? That means people who make God who's incorruptible. You made him corruptible according to your man made image. Have you realized that everybody has like this different perception of Jesus. Jesus is who he is according to his word, period, the end. Whatever he said, whatever he did, whatever he commanded, that is who he is. But it's saying here, people have changed the incorruptible God into this corruptible image of a man made, an image made like a, like a corruptible man. That means you've made Jesus into this corruptible person that you've created in your mind like you rebuke somebody jesus would never do that oh jesus i'm gonna bring this up my wife got cursed out on facebook right yes. oh pretty much got cursed at right she posts jesus and someone said jesus wouldn't talk like that you know jesus love compassion and whatever it is and she quotes scriptures <laughs> And she said, like, this is the gospel. And the person got mad and started cursing. Why? Because that's the world that we live in, that people have this image of a Jesus that's not that you see in the Bible. People say, oh, Jesus was love and all these different things. He is love, but in his love is judgment and wrath and different things. Yes, God has mercy on those who show mercy. But the Bible says, if you show no mercy... God is not going to give you any mercy. So it's like you got to comprehend who Jesus is. But people have created this Jesus. That's not a biblical Jesus, right? And it says here, like I said, so you you touch Jesus this or that. All of a sudden, like I say, oh, you're judgmental. Oh, you're, you're criticizing. Oh, you're too hard. You're religious. It's like, but I'm quoting the Bible. So where are you, where are you getting this I perception of this Jesus 
that doesn't confront nobody, that doesn't convict sin, that doesn't call people to repentance. That's what Jesus was doing. John the Baptist, who prepared the way for Jesus, what was his message? Repent, for the kingdom of God is at hand. That's his main thing that he kept saying. So you tell people, repent, because Jesus is coming back. You're being judgmental. You're judging me and this and that. God's not like that. God's telling only people that he loves him. It's like, yeah, God will love He loves you. But if you don't love him back, your life's not going to go in a good direction, right? So it says here, and birds, so it says, into uh, they created God into an image made like corruptible man and birds and four-footed animals, creeping things. Therefore, God also, so this is what God does in return, gave them up to uncleanness in the lust of their hearts to dishonor their bodies among themselves who exchanged the truth of God for the lie. So these are people, your mind is being handed over because you gave up the truth of God for a lie. So it's like, you. What, what's the truth of God? His word. When you're saying that scripture is not for me, the Bible, that's not my definition. That's not my truth. Because that, that's the new thing now. That's not my truth. <laughs> it's like, there's only one truth. And it's not me or yours. It's what God's truth, right? So... I said, these are people who gave up the truth of God for a lie and worshiped and served the creature rather than the creator. What's the creatures? What people say, philosophies and things that people say, those are creatures. We're, we're creatures, we're creation, but we're not the creator. So you're giving in to what creation is teaching and saying and doing rather than what the creator himself has said. So when someone quotes a verse and you're like, oh, that's too mean, that's too harsh, and that's too that, and you choose to reject that because it doesn't sound like God, um, you're creating a God in your own mind that's not the God of the Bible. And if you choose to continue in that, your mind will be handed over. And it says, for even their woman exchanged the natural use for what is against nature. Likewise, also the men leaving the natural use of the woman burning their lust for one another, men with men committing what is shameful and receiving themselves the penalty of their error, which was due. So this is this is the other way you get a, re a reprobate mind when you're doing unnatural things, the LGBT community, all these different things, people who live for drugs and this alcohol, fornicating, all the drug. When you live your life for that, God is saying here. When you're giving up what God cr created to be natural and you're going for unnatural uses, he's going to hand you over to a reprobate mind. It says, so God, and it says, and even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a debased mind to do, to do those things which are not fitting, being filled with all unrighteousness, sexual immorality, wickedness, covetousness, maliciousness, Full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, evil mindedness. They are whisperers, backbiters. You know what a backbiter is? Someone who's always talking about other people. Haters of God, violent, proud, boasters, inventors of evil things, disobedient to parents, undiscerning, untrustworthy. That means people can't trust you unloving, unforgiving, unmerciful, who knowing the righteous judgment of God, that those who practice such things are deserving of death, not only to do the same, but also approve of those who practice them. So the scriptures give you a list that if you choose to do these things and be this way, you will be handed over to a debased mind. It even says envy. Those are sins that sometimes people think, people always think about sex and the drugs, but what about envy? You're jealous of people. You're comparing yourself to other people. Those are forms of envy. Strife, you cause problems between people, right? You gossip. When you you, you gossip, you cause strife because you're repeating to somebody else something about someone else and you're causing all these issues. Disobedient to parents, all these different things. When you do these things, according to the Bible, God says he's going to hand you over to a reprobate mind which means a non-functioning brain. Once you've reached that point, I have yet to find a scripture where you get undone. And, and, and this is me. 
I believe once you reach that point, there's that's the point of no return because that means God, because that's the direction you want it to go in. He hands you over to it. There's no turning back from that. So what are things to look for? That's why I said the mental health thing. That's why some people in this world more than ever are heading in that direction. Why? Because Jesus is coming back and Satan is trying to take as many people as he can with him. And it starts where? In the mind. If he can get your mind to betray God, if he can get your mind to, to think ungodly, unholy things, and you have a lifestyle. I know so many Christians, like they proclaim Christ, they go to church, and they have a lifestyle of sin that they've justified. And they're like, I'm just going to keep doing this. This is how I am. I'm going to keep doing it. If that's how you choose to do, you think you're getting away, but what you're actually doing is you're sending yourself to Satan himself. And guess what God's going to do? He's going to hand your mind over to him. Basically, have his mind. It belongs to you now. That's some scary stuff. <laughs> I don't know about you, but that 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 should put the fear of God in you. Say, I want to make sure my mind is good so my mind doesn't get handed over. See, you guys might be listening and say, man, this is pretty tough word. I didn't write this. <laughs> I say this every time. I didn't write this. This was in the Bible. So these are things that we should look for. So people with a debased mind, this is how you'll know if someone has a debased or reprobate mind. The person puts their emotions and opinions over God's word. They reject his word because their feelings supersede his word. That's how you know that someone can possibly have a reprobate mind. You show them the scripture, you show them the verse. And I'm talking important verses. I'm not talking about a mix cloth with linen clothing and you don't agree with it. And I'm not, I'm not talking about those kind of verses. Yeah. You say, Jesus is Lord. Jesus is the only way. And they say, no, he's not the only way. And they you know, because I feel this and that, and they'll start bringing up their opinions. That person's mind is either heading towards that or has been handed over to a reprobate mind. You tell them, Hey, Satan, you, you, it's not right. You shouldn't sin. This things are going to send you to hell. And they say, no, I don't think God's going to send me to hell. If I sin, just like there's a doctrine, saved, always saved. There's people who believe once they accept Jesus Christ, they can never lose their salvation. They can do whatever they want, do all these things and sin and all they want because God's just going to keep forgiving them and it doesn't matter. And that there's no way you can lose your salvation. People who think like that, you have been handed over to a reprobate mind because the Bible doesn't say that. The Bible says to handle your salvation salvation in trembling and in fear. You know what that means to handle your salvation in trembling and fear? That means you need to take care of your salvation. You, you, you need to maintain it. You need to guard it and protect it because guess what? You can lose it. And how is it that you lose it? It's not like something you just fell out of your pocket and you dropped it. You lose it in the sense you give it up with the lifestyle. It's like, oh, my, my salvation, just like I dropped my wallet. I sat somewhere and it slipped out and I lost my salvation. That doesn't happen like that. You lived a lifestyle that you lived recklessly and Satan, you gave it to Satan. Hey, take my salvation, right? How do you know? Like I said, another thing, how someone could have a reprobate mind, they willfully sin as if God will do nothing about it and have lost their fear of God and conviction of sin. You that those are signs of someone who has possibly been already handed over to a, a reprobate mind. You just keep sinning, and there's no conviction there. There's nothing in you that says, "Man, this is wrong. I shouldn't be doing this." And there's not, or there's nothing in them to say, "I need to stop," or "I'm going to try to stop," or "Find a way to stop." I'm not, and I'm not talking about the person who makes a mistake. They're trying their best to not make a mistake, and they fall again. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about the person who willfully, "I'm going to do this today." I'm going to do this tomorrow. And they just keep on doing it as if God's going to do nothing about it. Those are signs of someone who could be handed over to a reprobate mind. They believe that no matter what sin they do, they will enter into heaven and don't need to be holy or separated. That's a reprobate mind. That's not what the Bible teaches us. The Bible says without holiness, nobody can see the Lord. You have to be holy. The Bible says be holy for God is holy. There's a teaching now they think, oh, I'm, I'm not holy. Only God is holy. But the Bible says, it says without holiness, nobody will see the Lord. What's holiness? Holiness is not you doing everything right. Holiness is trusting in what Jesus did and putting on Jesus so he can give you the ability to do things right. 
And when you do that, you live a holy life. But if you choose not to live a holy life, you will not see the Lord. So there's people, how do you know they have a reprobate mind? They say they they think they can live an unholy life and God's going to let me in. That's not what the Bible teaches. They cannot comprehend anything spiritual, but yet they can comprehend worldly and demonic things with no problem. And they live worldly lives despite claiming to live for God and no one can get through to them. Have you ever met somebody like that? They don't understand nothing spiritual, no scriptures. They don't even read their Bible. You quote a scripture, they reject it and all this stuff, but yet they can comprehend demons. They can comprehend demonic things. They, they can, the worldly things. These are people like the, uh, in church, they don't even worship God, but yet they're at the club going, hey, hey, you can shake and dance with no problem at the club. But when you at church to worship, I can't get a peep out of you. Not a single word comes out of you or nothing and stuff like that. It's like you have, like the Bible says, wisdom to do the wrong things, but none for the things of God. You're either headed in that direction or you're already there with a reprobate mind that the things of God, you just reject it. It just does, does, does has, has no, no, nothing about it with you. Or maybe you're just not even saved. I'll even go as far as to say that. That if you talk God, we we talk, and there's nothing in you that says, I want to do things right. I love God. I want to try this. And maybe I don't understand the Bible, but I'm going to try to read it. But if there's nothing in you that's like that, either you're not saved or you have a reprobate mind. Another sign is they have multiple areas of sin in their life that they have no intentions of stopping. That is a person who either is in the in the direction of a reprobate mind or already has one they have multiple sin and they say in their mind i'm not gonna stop this isn't a person who oh i, I made a sin and i made a mistake this is a person who's willfully keeps doing this you keep sleeping with this guy you keep sleeping with this girl you know it's wrong you're gonna eventually god's gonna eventually hand you over to it you don't want to stop all right I'm not going to force you to stop. I'll let it have you. That's scary. <laughs> that is super scary because sometimes we think oh, I'm going to sin for a season. I'll be with this guy. Eventually I'll get rid of him or I'll get rid of this girl eventually. But what if God doesn't let you get to that point? What if because you think you're trying to play God, you're trying to play around and think you have and God hands you over to it. Now you can't get out of it. You've been handed over by God himself. That now, now this thing, you don't own that thing. That thing owns you. That's scary. That's why there's some people that like in Christ, they'll watch pornography. There's a lot of pastors that they'll watch pornography and they'll keep doing it and doing it. They learn how to play the system. Watch pornography a couple hours later. God, forgive me. I feel good. Next day, do it again. And they know they're going to do it again. This isn't like a person who's trying not to sin. This is like the person like they have this little system of, trying to trick and play God and abuse his mercy and forgiveness, you get handed over. And then those are the people who are just so far gone and lost. And you say, oh, that they're too far that God can't save. It's not about saving anymore. God tried that. It's this person wants this to live like this. So because they want to live like this, God's pretty much like have them, pretty much have them. And because why? Because God knows you have you there's you're, you have no intentions on stopping. That's scary. And and that should put the fear of God in you. Those are signs of a reprobate mind. Like I said, because in today's world, you can quote scriptures, you could talk about the Lord, and people will get mad at you, slander you, call you a demon. Say you don't have the love of Jesus in your heart, because how could you say that? It's like these things are in the Bible. If you have issues with what the Bible says and you choose to reject with what the Bible says, you're heading in the direction of a reprobate mind or you may have already been handed over to a reprobate mind. Listen, there's some verses that when things that we struggle with. There's certain sins we struggle with. I'm not saying because you struggle with a sin, you have a reprobate mind. What I'm saying is when you choose that, I'm going to do this. I'm going to keep sleeping with this person. I'm going to keep fornicating. I'm going to keep lying. I'm going to keep being angry. I'm going to keep being envious. I'm going to keep staying bitter. And I'm just going to stay this way because this is how I am. 
you will be handed over to it. God's going to let that thing own you because you have no intentions on stopping and, and stuff like that. But see, the beautiful thing is that in Jesus Christ, we're talking about reprobate mind, but God has called us to have a, a sound mind. When you have a sound mind, you cannot be handed over to a reprobate mind because you have a sound mind. And God has called us to have a sound mind. Who here has a sound mind? Or maybe you want a sound mind. Like I said, that's why the enemy attacks your thoughts. He doesn't want you to have a sound mind. So he'll attack your thoughts. Oh, look what you did years ago. You'll never be good enough. You've made too many mistakes. You're not smart enough. You're not you're not good looking. No one's ever going to want you. Uh, you're, you, you know, look how horrible your life is. And, and then you start believing these things and you fall into depression. You fall into anxiety. Uh, you know, you start worrying. You fear things. You fear your finances, your future, all these different things. And when these things it's a it's a daily a thing that it's running your mind uh struggling with sexual thoughts struggle, struggling with being jealous of people comparing you're proud you get angry easily you, you think all these different things if you allow these things on your mind on a daily basis the bible says that those thoughts will run your life they will run your life and the, so basically your thoughts determine the course of your life. If I'm thinking godly thoughts, it's going to take me towards God. If I'm thinking about someone else's wife, if I'm thinking about other women, guess what it's going to do? It's going to take me to that direction to fall with that person if I'm doing these things, right? But God, the beautiful thing with Jesus Christ is if you have the Holy Spirit, he gives you the ability to have a sound mind. Because God, see, look, for you that are on here, God doesn't desire for you for your mind to be all over the place, being defeated left and right, depressed, anxious about everything. You you have fear of any bad news that comes your way. Your mind just goes all in the wrong places. And your mind is in a negative place a majority of your time. That's not a sound mind. But listen, God can give you a sound mind. So what does that mean? A sound mind is taken from the Greek word sophronio, which is a compound word combining so sozo and phronio. The Greek word sozo means to be saved or delivered. It so it basically, it suggests something that is delivered, rescued, revived, salvaged, and protected, and is now safe and secure. That's what the Greek meaning of having a sound mind is, and we preach deliverance, so this is perfect, that meaning. So to have a sound mind, your mind must be delivered and then become secured. That's what a sound mind is, that your mind has been delivered. What does it mean to be delivered? I struggle with fear. God has not given me a spirit of fear. Deliver me from the spirit of fear so my mind doesn't have fearful thoughts. So I get delivered. Now that I got delivered from it, now I need to secure it, right? So it's like robbers get inside your house to steal your house. To get delivered from thieves that break into your house, that means you got you get them out. But see, it's not just getting them out. It's securing the house again so they can't come right back in. When we get our mind gets delivered, you need to secure it. That's how you get a sound mind. I struggle with pornographic thoughts. I think about sleeping with men and women or whatever it may be. Okay, you need to get delivered from a spirit of sexual immorality, a spirit of lust, maybe. And once I get delivered, I secure my mind. So I have a sound mind that when those thoughts come, because they're going to keep coming, just because you've been delivered doesn't mean that those thoughts are never going to try to find its way back. It just means that when they try, they can't penetrate, right? They can try, but it can't penetrate. Why? Because it's the mind is now secure. The enemy can't use the things of the of my past, right? He attacks me with thoughts of my past and things that I, I you know, all these different things. But I've been delivered from my past. You need to get delivered from thoughts of your past. What could be things that can cause you to not, you know, that need deliverance with your past? Unforgiveness, 
Uh, you have bitterness. You still hold hurt that somebody did to you in the past or anger or, like I said, all these different things, childhood trauma. And once you get delivered, now you need to secure it. And I'm going to show you how do you secure this. Why? It says James chapter 1, verse 8. It says a double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. That's why, like I said, we live in a culture where everyone has a mental health issue. Why? The Bible says it in James chapter 1, verse 8, that a double-minded person is unstable in all their ways. How do you know you have a double-minded, you're double-minded? That means, well, look at your life. Is there instability in multiple areas of your life? If you have instability in multiple areas of your life, that means you are double-minded. When you have a sound mind, you have mental stability. When you think, when you know that you're not mentally stable, it's because, or there's, I mean, there's no, there's certain areas of your life that you don't have stability, is you have double-mindedness. What's double-minded? You think, you think two things. It's almost like schizophrenia, right? Or bipolar. Those are demons. <laughs> if you struggle with schizophrenia or being bipolar, those are spirits that your mind needs to be delivered from. And then you need, it needs to be secured because that causes double mindedness. One minute, I love Jesus. Another minute, you know, screw Jesus. I don't love Jesus. Jesus doesn't love me. He hasn't helped me. He doesn't bless me. I pray to him. He doesn't answer back and forth. One minute, I love my mom. Um, a minute later, I hate my mom, my childhood. Look what she did to me. I can't stand it. Double mindedness. One minute, I'm going to follow Jesus. The next minute, I'm at the club, shaking it up, double-mindedness. And because you're double-minded, you will have instability in multiple areas of your life. If you, if you struggle with stability, chances are you have a double-minded. You're double-minded. I love Jesus. I want to follow him two minutes later. But let me just do this one sin. <laughs> let me just watch this porn video. Let me just sleep with this person. Let me just have that one more drink. If you do that, you're going to create instability in your life. And God says here, if you're not double-minded, you will be stable. But if you are double-minded, you will be unstable in all your ways. That's why people struggle with mental health because they're double-minded. And that's why they're not stable in their life. So like I said, so this world has mental health issues due to double-mindedness, which causes instability. When you have a sound mind, you're a stable person. God didn't give us a spirit of fear, but of power, love, and a sound mind. That means God is the one that gives us a sound mind. God can give it to you. If you have a double mind, you're double-minded, right? God can create, he can fix that. See, we're talking about these things, so it's not so you can feel horrible about it. But so you can get the help that you need so you can fix because God can fix this and make this right so you can have stability. So Satan doesn't have a field day with your thoughts telling you you're not good enough. You'll never be a man of God. You'll never be in your ministry. You'll never be a pastor. You'll never be a teacher. You'll never be a prophet, whatever it is, because that's what the enemy tells you. You're, you'll never be this. You'll never do that. Who are you? You know, that's what the enemy, that's the want to know how you know when Satan's talking to you. He always starts his conversations the same way, making you question who you are. That's when people say, oh, who do you think you are? I already know it's Satan talking when someone says that to me. Because who do I think I am? I'm a child of God. <laughs> so it, it, it starts off by questioning your identity. And if you can start to think, wait, who am I? Oh, wait, I'm nobody or I'm this. That's it. The enemy is going to have his field day because if he can get you to not know who you are, if you don't know who you are, then you won't know what you're capable. And if you're not knowing what you're capable of, you're never going to do what you need to do. So that's why it starts in the mind questioning you that. Like I said, and that's why we struggle with instability in our mind. But God, like I said, God didn't give us these things. He didn't give us none of those things. So because he didn't give us these things, we bring these things into our mind. And now because our mind deals with it, what happens? Your mind needs to get delivered. Second Corinthians chapter 12, verse four to six, it says, for the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, 
but mighty in God for pulling down strongholds, casting down arguments and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God, bringing every thought, right here it is, bringing every thought into captivity. This is how you get a sound mind. This is how your mind gets delivered. Your mind needs to be taken captive, right? Because sometimes Satan takes our mind captive. You say, well, how does Satan take my mind captive? How does he take your mind captive? When a whole entire day, your mind is thinking all the worst things of the world. All the most, ne all your mind is thinking negative things. Uh, I'm broke. Uh, I don't got no money. I can't do this. Nobody wants me. And, and your mind's just going to all these negative places. That means your mind has been taken captive by the enemy. And what, what is the word of God telling us? That we need to take our mind captive for what it says here. Bringing every thought into captivity to the obedience of Christ. We need to basically our mind, we need to take it captive and make it obey Jesus. See, that's when you struggle with negative thoughts, you struggle with depression, anxiety, you struggle with fear and, and doubts and worry, identity issues. Uh, you know, my marriage is going to fall apart. Or I'll never have kids or I'll never have a good job. I'm always going to be broke. When these negative thoughts come in, what you need to say is I'm taking you captive, right? And I'm going to make you obey Jesus Christ. That verse was uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 4 to 6. So say you take the thoughts captive, it says to the obedience of Christ, you make it obey. Because sometimes we casually expect our minds just to get better on its own. If you do that, your mind's never going to get better. You need to take it captive. When I, I used to struggle with depression and I said, no, no, no. When a negative thought would come in, Jamie, you're going nowhere. You're not going to do this. This is not going to get better for you. And this I say, no. This, no, you're not going to think these things. So I'm taking you captive and I'm making you obey. I'm going to make my thoughts believe that Jesus is my hope. Jesus is my healer, that he has plans for me. He has a future for me. He's going to prosper me. So I make my thoughts, make it obey. So I cast down every thing in my mind that raises up oh don't talk to that person remember what they did to you and screw them and if you struggle with bitterness and you're resentful and you're always angry always in a bad mood or you always have a bad attitude that means you don't have a sound mind your mind needs to get delivered and the enemy is having a field day with your mind and that means you let whatever mind whatever garbage comes into your mind you're letting it do whatever it wants to you when Satan comes in, masturbate, go masturbate, go watch pornography, go sleep with that person, go cheat on your spouse. It's not like, oh, God, please, I hope this thought goes away. No, no, no. That's not how you do it. You say, no, I'm not going to think this. And so this thought that tries to partake in my mind, I'm going to make you obey Jesus. So instead of me going to go watch porn or masturbate or sleep or do this or have that drink, and smoke that weed and do that drug, I'm going to make you obey. And I'm going to make my, make my thoughts think about Jesus. Make my thoughts think about living pure. I'm going to make you have to be intentional with your walk with God. Don't be casual. Casual Christians become casualties. Amen. So it says, bringing every thought into the captivity to the obedience and being ready to punish all disobedience when your obedience is fulfilled. So you got to tell Satan, Satan, I'm going to punish you, <laughs> right? Because some of us, we've, let, we've allowed Satan to punish us and have his way with us in our mind and play with our mind, play with our life and do whatever he wants. But here it says, take your, take your thoughts captive to the obedience of Christ and be ready to punish. So I listen, you think Satan wants to attack a mind? that has a mindset on obeying Christ and anything that comes to try to make it go against Christ, that you say, I'm going to punish you. <laughs> you think Satan really wants to mess with that person's mind? No. So this is the mindset you got to have. You say, I'm going to take my thoughts captive, make it obey Jesus and Satan and any thought that comes <laughs> needs to be on a shirt. Yeah. We probably make that shirt next, right? Casual Christians will become casualties. So, 
when when well guess what when satan casually you think satan casually attacks you no he intentionally attacks you to try to destroy you you know what you have to, the mindset you have to come satan you came to try to make me fall into porn or into anger or drugs or to cheat or to be angry or to be bitter or resentful unforgiving i'm going to punish you that's that's the mindset you got to have see i i i think jesus that i used to be a boxer because I always had that mindset whenever I used to fight or spar and somebody got me with a good shot. Oh, I'm going to get you back real good for that one. You got me with that shot. I'm going to clip you with three shots and I'm going to make sure I drop you. So that mindset. Thank you, Jesus. I have that mindset for Satan. Satan, you you caught me with a good shot. Oh, I got a good one coming right back for you. And that's how Christians we need to have. We can't just be this casual Christian. Be intentional with your mindset. So. Whatever mindset, oh, your life sucks. You're you're miserable. You're not going nowhere. Are you going to listen to these thoughts? Or are you going to say, no, I'm not going to listen to this. I'm going to make it obey Jesus. And these thoughts, I'm going to punish it. You say, well, how do you punish Satan? I'm going to get on my knees. I'm going to say, Jesus, I love you. Regardless of what my life is, I love you anyways. God, those people who hurt me, I forgive them. God, these things I'm struggling with, I hand them over to you. And these demons that are coming against me, I rebuke you by the authority of Jesus. I cast you back into the pits of hell. That's how you punish Satan, man. Don't get me preaching. <laughs> Don't get me preaching. Right? So, and it says, and when your obedience is fulfilled. OK, so then that's how you get delivered. Now, how do you secure the mind? Right. The mind gets delivered. Now we got to secure it. Right. Philippians chapter four, verse eight to nine. Philippians chapter four, verse eight to nine. It says, finally, brethren, whatever things are true, whatever things are noble, whatever things are just, whatever things are pure, whatever things are lovely, whatever things are of good report. If there is any virtue and if there is anything praiseworthy, meditate on these things. You have to meditate. I'm not talking the yoga and, the hum and just being quiet and you're, that, that's demonic. I'm not talking about that. Oh, brother, I'm in meditation and doing yoga. That's not what I'm talking about. Meditate on God's word. Think about God's word. That's what helped me not to sin. I know if I, okay. What does God's word say? If I if I live holy, if I live righteous, if I obey him, guess what? He rewards obedience. He rewards holiness. He's going to bless me. So I'm going to think about that, that if I stay, I stay clean, right? And I stay pure, God's going to bless me. So I'm going to think about those things. If I give into negative thoughts, my life is going to take a negative turn. That's what God's word says. My, thought, my thoughts run my life. So I'm going to think of God's word that says that. And it's going to help me not to want to let my life have negative thoughts, right? So I have to maintain these thoughts. I secure them by meditating on good things. See, sometimes we're so focused on not thinking the bad things, but guess what? You're just not thinking on bad things. Well, guess what? Now you have an empty, idle mind. So the thoughts are going to keep coming in. But an occupied mind that's occupied on Christ, there's no room. There's no room. Satan can't fill something where there's no room, right? Satan is not going to fill my mind with porn and anger and lust and jealousy and envy and bitterness. If my mind is filled with love and peace and compassion, hope, I don't, I don't have envy because I am happy when other people get blessed and all these different things. So it's like, Satan, there's no room for you. <laughs> like you can try to move in, but something else lives here you gotta you gotta make sure your house how do you do it by meditating on the good things oh you know negative thoughts of the future well you can't get me with that because god's already told me what my future is you know so it's you, your mind has to be busy by meditating and it says and if there's any version if there's anything praise where meditate on these things the things which you learned and received and heard and saw in me these do and the god of peace will be with you why? Because when you don't have a sound mind and you have a reprobate mind, or maybe you have, like I said, the enemy's having, you have no peace. That's because your mind, why do you have no peace? Because your mind is being attacked. It's being, has been infiltrated. But it says here that if you're thinking of praiseworthy things, you're thinking godly things, pure things, things that are noble, the good things, positive things, it says then the peace of God will be with you. 
Romans chapter 12, verse 1 to 2, it says, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by what? The renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Constantly, this has to be your thing every day. God, renew my mind. This is something you need to do every day. In the morning, when you pray, say, Lord, renew my mind. What does it mean to make to renew it? Get rid of the garbage, fix, patch up and fix up the areas that you know you shouldn't. And God, give me a new way of seeing, seeing things, right? How do you renew your mind? Okay, I used to slap this person or curse them out when they would. So renew it, okay? Make it a different way. I'm going to love them. Jesus, God bless you. I love you, but man, I hope that things will turn out good for you. Even though you said this to me, I'm going to renew your mind. You used to think things in a perverted way. Oh, this person is just doing something to try to be malicious and backstab me. Stop thinking like that. Renew your mind and say, no, that person is a child of God. God died for them. Okay, maybe they're not saved, but God died for them. So renew your way of thinking. When you start thinking how Christ just like the what would Jesus do? Remember those bracelets? It's you gotta honestly, you gotta do that. How would Jesus view this person? How would Jesus respond to this person? How would Jesus think about this situation? And when you know that, then it says here, when you do that, you'll be able to know what is good and acceptable and what is the perfect will of God. People who don't know the perfect will of God, basically, they you they never know what's God's will of their life. It's because their mind has not been renewed. There's an area of your life you need to renew. When you're not, your mind is renewed, you know the will of God. You know, you'll know. Why? Because you're, you're, you have the mind of Christ. Those are people like, I don't know about my job. I don't know about my career. I don't know where I'm going to live. I don't know where I'm going to do about my children. I don't know what I'm going to do about this situation. I don't know what I'm going to do about my finances. And others. I don't know what God's will for my calling and my ministry. If you don't know these things, that means you're, you haven't been renewing your mind. Because when you renew your mind, you have the mind of Christ. If you have the mind of Christ, you'll know the will of Jesus Christ for your life. You'll know his will. And you and, and when you know his will, guess what? You'll do his will. So those people say, well, I know what the will of God is for my life. But, okay, are you doing the will of God? Because if you knew it, you'd be doing it. And that's how you know. So my question today to you is, what kind of mind do you have? A reprobate mind, like I said, is the last stage. So I don't want no one writing in the chat, pray for me. I have a reprobate mind. Trust me, if you have one, you would have been logged off already. Trust me, you would have logged off and probably never come back to church again. So let's make this clear for anyone. Jamie, can you pray for me? I think I have a reprobate mind. Trust me, if you did, you wouldn't be asking for prayer. Trust me. But if you if you live a willful sin of life, you are heading in that direction. That is a fact. Like I said, it's the last stage of being away from the Lord in your mind and having a sound mind is this always to be the stage being close to Christ. Some of us, like I said, are in the middle. And in order to trans transition over to a sound mind, you must deliver your mind and then secure it with having the mind of Christ. If you choose to continue in sin, you will be handed over to a debased mind. So some of you, like I said, all of you, trust me, you don't have a debased mind. But guess what? You might be in the middle. You might be in the middle. If someone has a reprobate mind, can we pray them out of it? I mean, you could try, but the thing is God handed over them over to it. I don't, me, this is me. You don't have to agree with me. I don't think so. I don't think so. Because this is person, listen, if God handed you over, that means he knew the future. Pray for them anyways, because the Bible says pray for any, everybody. So I'm not going to tell you, don't pray for them. But I'm, I'm going to tell you this, if you pray and don't expect, but the thing is, how do you know they have a reprobate mind? That's the real, real question. Because we all have a phase that we don't choose to follow Jesus. Does that mean because we're not following Jesus, we have a reprobate mind? No, maybe you're just not saved. The thing is, a reprobate mind is a person who truly has a knowledge, right? A true this better yet, a perfect example, I would say, is a person. How do you know I have a reprobate mind? This is someone who served Jesus at some point, right? 
They love, they've been used, been Holy Ghost, and they have rejected all that, cursed it, won't want to live in the opposite life. That's a person that's most likely has the reprobate mind. But if it's a person who's never been saved and never really has accepted Jesus and all that stuff, because the reprobate mind is, it says once you have received the knowledge of the truth and then you give it up, that's a reprobate mind. So if this loved one truly has a knowledge of Jesus, truly had a relationship with Jesus at some point and stuff like that and stuff, um, I would I wouldn't I don't know I wouldn't say Ju Judas has a reprobate mind because that's different. Um, blaspheming the Holy Spirit is that considered? Um, I would say yes because um, it, and the thing is with the blaspheming the Holy Spirit, there's a lot of Christians who think they've blasphemed the Holy Spirit and they're terrified of it. If you're terrified of it, you didn't blaspheme. <laughs> oh, when, when you, when you. Trust me, when you curse the Holy Spirit and you blaspheme the Holy Spirit, trust me, you have no care of what the repercussions or any of it is. That's why you won't be forgiven of it. And that's why that's the point of no return and stuff like that. Judas, uh, I wouldn't say he had a reprobate mind because he was prophesied. Prophecy was being fulfilled. So he was cursed. He was cursed to, the, to be in that position. So uh, when you have a reprobate mind, it's not that you were cursed by God. It was you pretty much you you cursed yourself <laughs> uh because it's not like god wanted you or made you so i wouldn't i would not say that G judas had a reprobate mind uh he 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 was prophesied it was prophecy being fulfilled so if you've been handed over to a reprobate mind it wasn't prophecy being fulfilled over your life is that you god gave you a chance god speaks to you and like i said and i'm not saying that because there's some stubborn people. There's some people who takes a while for them to love Jesus or give their life to Jesus. It doesn't mean that they have a reprobate mind. A reprobate mind isn't, doesn't mean, I don't, I don't want you to think that every person that's not saved has a reprobate mind. They might, they're heading in that direction if they're not saved. But a reprobate mind is someone who clearly has had knowledge of the word. They know the word and all this stuff and reject it and don't want no parts to do with it. And there's nothing in them. Yes, they have a reprobate mind. And praying them, yeah, go ahead, pray for them. But I have not seen one scripture that tells you uh, how to get a reprobate per person back. Uh, this I just don't see that. Because think about it. If For those who have received the Holy Spirit on here, have spoken in tongues, have been delivered, demons come out, you've been healed in the miracles of God, and you have truly experienced God. and that you can say, screw God, I don't want nothing, or he's not real, I don't want not, or he is real, and I don't believe, I don't want to believe in him, he, I don't care about hell, and just go the complete opposite direction, yes, that's a reprobate mind, but you can't say that about someone who hasn't experienced that, you, it has to be someone who has experienced that, and has went the other way, and like I said, and even if they didn't experience that, you might be headed in that direction. You're listen, if you're willfully sinning, period the end, you're headed towards that direction. The Bible, we just read it in the scripture. You're headed in that direction. So you can pray, God, if this person's headed in a reprobate mind direction, I pray that God that you would help them repent, strengthen them, give them conviction of sin. But knowing that, hey, if this person doesn't stop, yeah, eventually they will be. So pray for them because they might be headed in that direction. But to know if they truly are already handed over, um, it has to have been someone who has experienced God, like the Bible says, and then they exchanged. See, the thing is, the Bible says they, they exchanged. That word is so important because that means at some point they were saved. At some point they gave their life to God. At some point they loved Jesus. At some point they knew the scriptures and then they exchanged it to do what they wanted what they believed that's how you know they have a reprobate mind they exchanged it so if it's someone who's never had knowledge never loved jesus never gave their life to jesus they're headed towards reprobate mind but they don't have it yet because they haven't exchanged anything yet right so um 
Is there an example of anyone who had a reprobate mind? I mean, there's been people who's been handed over to Satan. Um, Paul has handed people over to Satan. And Ananias Sapphire have been handed over to Satan and stuff like that. But a reprobate not mind, per se, no. No, there's really been never an example. But that's the closest example because the reprobate mind is just being handed over to Satan. Right? So let's continue. I hope that answers you guys' question. I want to read this last verse and we'll end. First Corinthians chapter two, verse 14 and 16, it says, but the natural man, this might answer some of you guys' question, but the natural man does not receive the things of the spirit of God for they are foolishness to him, nor can he know them because they are spiritually discerned. But, be, but he who is spiritual judges all things, yet he himself is rightly judged by no one who has known the mind of the Lord that he may instruct them, but we have the mind of Christ. So when you don't have this, so it's if someone, like I said, I don't want to confuse reprobate mind with not knowing Christ and just not being saved. Is a drug addict who won't or doesn't desire to quit consider? Yeah. I would say that a person that's like, I'm doing like, just because the person won't stop sinning, I won't, like I said, I'm not going to jump right away to say they're a reprobate. But when that person says, listen, when the person can say, I'm going to do this sin, God is going to do nothing about it. I don't care what the Bible says. That's not true. And this is what I'm going to do. And their life proves it. Yeah, they have a reprobate mind. They have a reprobate mind and they have no de desire. Now, there's people who have no desire to stop sinning, but at least they'll say, I know what I'm doing is wrong or I know this is a sin, but whatever. At least they recognize some form of truth. But these people, they, they don't see that as a truth. If they don't see that this like, oh, this is not going to send me to hell and this and that. Yeah, that's a reprobate mind. Amen. But like I said, at the end of the day, what we need to focus on is that God wants us to have a sound mind. We need to have a sound mind. We need to make sure that our mind is meditating on God's word so the enemy doesn't have a field day with our mind. So the enemy is not doing whatever he wants. Because guess what? When you're thinking these things, they're going to run your life. And the enemy is going to do whatever he wants with you. You're going to have negative thoughts in the morning. You'll wake up and you're already having demonic thoughts in the morning. Before you go to sleep, demonic thoughts. You'll have demonic nightmares all the time. Uh, maybe sleep paralysis, all these different things, because your mind, eh, you don't have a sound mind. And when you don't have a sound mind, you don't have stability. You There's multiple areas of your life where you don't have stability. You are, The Bible says a double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. That's James chapter 1, verse 8. You're unstable in all your ways. But I'm here to tell you that God wants to make every area of your life stable. He wants you to have a stable mind. He wants you to have control over your thoughts and that when satan comes to attack your mind and attack your thoughts and to get you to fall in sin that you can say satan i'm gonna punish you <laughs> you're saying my marriage is gonna end i'm gonna punish you for that one you're saying my children will never be saved say i'm gonna punish you for that one <laughs> satan you're saying my finances are never gonna get better that i'm never gonna prosper i'm going to punish you for that and like i said that's what we need to take a mindset to say, I'm going to make my thoughts obey Jesus. I'm going to make my thoughts submit to what Christ's word says. I'm not going to give in to these desires. I'm going to give hand over these desires to God. And I'm going to set my mind on Jesus. And if you struggle with your thoughts, we're going to pray for you. And I want you to confess what you struggle with in your mind. because. How do you have a sound mind? According to the Greek word, sound mind means a mind that's been delivered and secured. Your mind has to be delivered. If your mind is all day, every day, majority of your day, negative thoughts, bitterness, resentment, you can't stand certain people, you know, and there's no matter what no one says, you don't want to hear about it, about them and all these different things. Guess what? You need to get your mind delivered. You, your mind always having fear, always having fear. You got to deliver and then and secure it because that's the thing. Don't always be asking for deliverance. Ask God to give you the ability to secure it, secure it. 
I, like I gave a preaching a while back, go from deliverance to dominion saying, okay, God, you delivered me from this. Now I'm, I need to st strive for dominion that I have dominion over this. You could say pornography. I have dominion over you. You don't dominate me. I dominate you. Fear. I dominate you. Doubt, worry, anger, depression, sadness, loneliness. You don't dominate me. I dominate you. And you need to make it fall into submission to Jesus. Make those spirits fall into submission to Jesus. Because guess what? You have authority in Christ Jesus. God has given his people authority that you can tell these negative thoughts. You have to submit to the obedience of Christ. Oh, you're going nowhere. You're a loser. Nobody wants you. And this is going to go bad for you. Your life is a mess. No, you have to submit to the authority of Jesus Christ. And I am going somewhere because God. I'm, if I'm holding God's hand, I'm going wherever he's going. So that means I'm going somewhere. Oh, your finances, God's going to prosper me and all these different things. Oh, your, your family, they're never going to change. They'll never be saved and this and that. Uh, God's word says me and my household shall serve the Lord. Oh, I have a broken relationship with this person. My, my relationship with a family member is messed up and this and that. The Bible calls God a redeemer and restorer for a reason. So Satan, you come in against me to tell me my family won't get restored. My marriage won't get restored. My relationship with my family or whoever it is won't get restored. Uh, I rebuke you because that's not what the word of God says. The word of God says that he is my redeemer. He is my restorer and he can heal and he can fix. So I make my mind think whatever Jesus, whew, whatever Jesus word says, that's what I'm going to think about. Oh, that I, I'm going to get sick and I'm going to die young. The Bible says, oh, that by his stripes, I am healed. So I, I, I'm healed. I don't have to worry about sickness. And even if sickness comes and he takes me, guess what? I'm healed in heaven forever. And I'll never have to deal with sickness ever again. Oh, but what if, what if this goes wrong for you? What if you lose your job? My God is my provider that God is provides for me. And if he cares for the birds of the air and the beast of the field, and he gives them clothing and he feeds them, how much more does he care about us that he'll take care of our needs? So I'm not going to let Satan play with my mind that I'm not going to have enough, that I can't pay my bills, that I can never own a home and that I can never have this and that I can never provide. I'm here to tell you, man, now you got me, now y'all got me preaching. Now I'm here to tell you that Satan is a liar and you got to put him in his place and say, devil, I'm going to punish you. Write it in the chest, say, devil, I'm going to punish you for those thoughts you're putting into my head. Oh, you're putting bad thoughts that I'm, my family's sick and there's going to be death and that there's going to be this and there's going to be that. For God has not given me a spirit of fear, but of power, love, and a sound mind. God has given us a sound mind. Satan, I'm not even going to allow you to trick me into thinking my family is going to eventually have a reprobate mind. I, I have authority in Christ Jesus that my family, whoever they are, that Jesus, I can pray and whatever spirits are making them head in the direction of reprobate mind. God, you can reverse it and I can stand in the gap for them that they can be delivered in Christ Jesus so they can have a sound mind and they can be saved. Oh, but you sin too much. Why would God listen to your prayer? Why this and that? Because I believe in the word of God that he who the sin sets free is free indeed. That means God can set me free from whatever sin I struggle with. And the Bible says that the righteous fall down seven times, but they get back up every single time. So it's not about how many times I fall, but how many times I'm getting back up. So Satan, you're trying to condemn me that I'm not good enough and that I'm going to hell. Well, guess what? The Bible says there's no condemnation for those who are in Christ. So if I have Christ, I'm not condemned to hell. And you put Satan in his place. You put him in his place. Oh, you're, God, you're not going to have this. You're not going to have the other. But the Bible says that his promises and his words are yes and amen. God has promises for me. They're going to come to pass. Why? Because the Bible says God is not a liar. He's not a man to lie, nor is he one to change his mind. If God has spoken something for your life, guess what? God didn't lie. And if God spoke to something about your life, that he's going to do something, guess what? He's going to do it. He's not like people. He's not like a man who says one thing and next minute he's bipolar, changing his mind. Ah, I don't want to do it no more. He's going to do it. 
the enemy wants to play in your mind and make you think he's not, you got to make your thoughts obey Jesus. Make your thoughts submit to Jesus Christ. Oh, you're, everything you're doing in your life, it's going to fail. It's eventually going to fall apart. No, it's not. It's going to fall into place. <laughs> you need to, the same way they exchange their thoughts for the evil things, and that's how they have a reprobate mind, exchange the bad thoughts for the good ones. Say, Satan, the lies, the fear, the porn, the lust, take that garbage with you. I'm exchanging. I'm taking the mind of Jesus Christ. I'm taking the mind. I like what my wife said, cast them down. And that's the thing you got to do. You cast them down. When those thoughts come in, I cast you down. Oh, your, your thing's not going to get restored. I cast that thought down in Jesus name. God is going to restore it. And you think a mind like that? And then the thing is, the Bible says to punish. <laughs> Say, how do you punish Satan now? I'm going to get into warfare. Devil, I rebuke you. I come against you. I send you back into the pits. See, sometimes when I when Satan's trying to give me a hard time, I'm like, all right, I'm going to bind you. I send you into the pits of hell, and I pray that the angels of Jesus Christ carry you each one by your arms, take you there, chain you up, and they sing the name of Jesus all in your ear until your ears bleed over and over again at the name of Jesus. <laughs> I'm going to punish you. So you think Satan wants to come against you when you think like that? Freddie said you got to be militant. You have to be militant. I'm, I'm a, like I said, just like in boxing, when I used to spar and bah, a guy, a guy hit me. All right. Boom. Get, get them right back. Say, that's what you got to do is say, saying I'm going to punish you. You coming after my finances? I'm going to punish you. You want to come after my family? Guess what? I'm going to punish you. And the demons that you sent, I'm going to send them crawling right back to you on their knees saying, please don't send me to him again. <laughs> that's the mindset you got to have in Christ. Why? Because it's your authority in Jesus. It's not about you. It's not about you or how scary you look and how loud you pray. It's not about that. It's about Christ in you. It's about Christ in you and having a mind of Jesus, having the mind. See, think about it. If you have a mind of Jesus, you talk like Jesus, you think like Jesus, and you act and you do what Jesus is doing. When Satan sees you, he's terrified of you because why? He sees Jesus. He sees Jesus. And my wife said, read the devil a bedtime story. Read him a bedtime story. And this is my favorite saying, and I'll say it all the time. I don't check under my bed to see if Satan is under there. Satan's checking under his bed to see if I'm there. And that's the thought size. You know how we don't, let our, we don't like to let our feet hang off the bed because we think that Satan's going to grab our feet and snatch it and pull us? No, nah, de devil, you better not let your toes hang over that bed because I'm going to grab you and I'm going to snatch you, right? That's the mindset you got to have. Why? Because not because we're big and bad and we're the most amazing thing. No, it's because Jesus, what he did, and his spirit lives in me. And because his spirit lives in me, I could do all things through Christ who gives me the strength. Because of Christ, not because of you, not because of your righteousness, not because how many Bible verses, you know, but because your faith and your trust is in Jesus and you have the mind of Christ. Amen. Whew. Went from Bible teaching to preaching. So. We're going to pray. Dress, I need this. I can admit I need to dominate the last pieces of hatred and anger from my divorce. I need to secure my deliverance. I confess it before you that I still struggle with bitterness towards my ex and the woman my husband was with. I have conversations that make other people not like her, judge him. I plead my case constantly about where, why they were so wrong. Instead of preaching forgiveness and praising Jesus for how by their mistake I was delivered from an abusive relationship that God didn't want for me, the bitterness has affected me and other people around me. Bitterness has deep roots that affects my other relationships, and I cast all of that down. Yep, when those negative thoughts come in, Oh, hate this person. I can't believe they did this to you. You know, you got to say, yeah, I can't believe they did it to you. But guess what? Believe it. They did it. Now get over it. Forgive them. Love them and bless them and hope that they repent and they and they get saved. That's what we got to do. That's the mindset we got to take. Because that's, that's how we soak in misery. Poor me. They did this to me. How could they do this? I don't deserve this. Because guess what? That's how Satan is slick. If you think that way, then you become self-entitled, self-righteous, that you think you're so good that this shouldn't happen to you. When the Bible says that because Jesus suffered, we all suffer. We're all going to suffer. When you think, I don't deserve to go through anything, it's self-righteousness.
And that's how the enemy gets us in. And that comes from pride. And what's pride? The Bible says God opposes the proud and gives grace to the humble. So it's like, and I remember, I learned this from my wife. My wife used to tell me, Jamie, it's not about your respect. Because sometimes, hey, that person disrespected me. I got to let them know they can't do this to me. And my wife's like, it ain't about your respect. It's not about that. Because that comes from pride. It, it's about Jesus. It's about him. And I remember when she told that to me, and I'm like, man, you don't understand. <laughs> it's not about, it, is, it made me think, it's not about me or my respect. It's about Jesus. And that's it. So if someone says, screw you, you know, says whatever they want to me, it's not about my respect. It's about Jesus. Amen. But keeping in mind, saved, not soft. <laughs> Amen. So if you need prayer about your mind, maybe you're worried that maybe you're headed towards a reprobate mind. There's nothing wrong with that. Pray for it. That God can give you a sound mind. Maybe you're, you're like I said, your your mind you need to get your mind delivered from some things because you will write in the chat, say, my mind struggles with this and that. And it's something I constantly think about. It's something that I constantly am battling with. Well, guess what? Ask God. And if you say today, well, I have a sound mind. This message wasn't for me because I have a sound mind. Just ask yourself, are you stable in all your ways? Or is there some areas of your life there's instability? That'll tell you everything. That's what the Bible says by their fruit. You shall know them. Amen. So if you need prayer, write it. If not, let's get this thing going. Father, we just thank you, Jesus. Father, I just thank you so much, Father, for this today's message. Because it's something we all need to hear, Lord. We all need to have a sound mind. What does that mean? We all need to have the your mind, the mind of Christ. So today, Jesus, I pray that you would strengthen us all. Strengthen us to have godly thoughts. We won't have wicked thoughts, demonic thoughts, fleshly thoughts, thoughts of rebellion and disobedience, thoughts that come in and tell us don't do the will of God, don't serve Jesus. There's thoughts that tell us that we're not called, that we can't preach, we don't know how to pray, and all these negative thoughts, Father, we cast those things down in Jesus' name. And Father, today, give us your mind. Give us your mind so we can think like you, because if we think like you, we'll do what you did, Father God. And your word says that we will do greater things in your name. And I believe that. So I pray right now for my sister, Drea, Lord, help her, Lord, deliver her from bitterness, deliver her from anger, deliver her from the unforgiveness, Father, because that's the root of it is unforgiveness that she can truly forgive and forget because we say sometimes, oh, I forgive, but I don't forget. But because you choose not to forget, that's why you don't forgive. And the Lord is saying right now, you need to forget about what they did because if you don't forget about it that means you're thinking about it and if you're thinking about it guess what it'll run your life and that's a saying that we say oh, i forgive but i don't forget and the lord is saying dre don't say that don't say oh i forgave them but i'm not going to forget god is saying forget because we're supposed to be like jesus and the bible says that god for chooses to forget forgive and forget our sin you can forget it about someone else's because if you choose to not forget about it, guess what? You'll think about it and it'll continue to torment you. So you need to forgive and forget. Forget it just the same way Jesus has forgotten about your sin. And the Bible says why? Because he throws it at the deepest parts of the ocean and remembers it. No, The Bible says that God chooses to remember our sin no more. He chooses not to remind himself of it. So you need to make a choice. The Lord is saying you need to make a choice not to remind you. This is the problem is that you remind yourself of what people did. Don't remind yourself anymore. And this thing will lose its grip on you. So, Father, I pray that you would give her the strength to not remind herself about what people did. That she would not remind herself that she didn't deserve this or any of these things. That she would forget about it. Because the same way you have forgiven and choose to not think about her sin. She needs to do the same. That is why we say we are Christians. We are trying to be like you, God. So help her. Help her with her thoughts. Deliver her right now from negative thoughts. Deliver her from lying thoughts. Deliver her from thoughts of anger and spite and payback. I don't know why I just see that in the spirit. You want, there's, pay, you want, there's a sense of payback. There's no payback. Vengeance is mine, saith the Lord. So I pray, Jesus, there would be no spite there. No thoughts and desires for revenge, Father God, to see anyone pay for what they did. Desire mercy on their life and forgiveness. Help her to see things and to see them through your eyes, Lord, and deliver her from fear, Lord. 
that she needs to stop fearing about everything that happens in her life, that it's going to have a negative outcome. For you have not given her a spirit of fear, but of power, love, and a sound mind. So I command every devil and demon that has entered into her mind out in the name of Jesus. I rebuke every spirit of fear, anxiety, and unforgiveness, and bitterness, and anger, and pride out in Jesus' name. And filled her thoughts with thoughts of peace, of joy, of hope, and the future that you have for her. In the name of Jesus Christ, Father. I thank you, Lord. I thank you for my brother Joshua, that you would secure his mind. Father God, that you would help him. And Father God, for his family, as, they're seek, as they need salvation from God and to repent, Father, I pray that you would help him, Lord. Secure his mind that his when his mind wants to wander and then when his mind wants to go into a negative place, when his mind wants to go in the place, Father God, to make him think he's he's, he's this isn't going anywhere or he doesn't know what to do about certain things. Father God, in Jesus' name, I pray you would give him your mind, Lord, that you would give him clear direction, Father God, if in his life, Father, that you would bring stability in every aspect of his life, Father God. Bring stability, Lord. Because I see, Father God, that you want to bring stability. And every aspect of his life. So I pray that anything that tries to cause double mindedness in him and in his wife or his marriage or in his family, Father God, even even his family members, Lord, that are not saved in their struggle with double mindedness of maybe one day giving their life to Jesus. But then the next day, they don't want to believe in you. They don't want to follow you. That double mindedness, that spirit, Father God, we cast it out in Jesus name and we speak it over the airs. And we pray, Lord, that you would send your spirit to these family members and that double mindedness will leave, Lord, so they can have your mind and give their life and their everything about themselves, Jesus Christ, over to you, Father. We pray for my wife that you would give her a sound mind, Father God, so she would not have no indecisiveness and that she could be a better mother and a wife and a friend. Father God, I thank you, Jesus, for my wife. I pray, Lord, that you would strengthen her mind, her mind, Father, that she would start to believe in herself more, Father God, because Look what you've done in her life. Look how long you protected her. Look how many times, look, Lord, you secured her, Lord, when she was in environments where she didn't wasn't supposed to be protected and secure, when she was in places where she was vulnerable, yet she was secure, Lord. I pray that she would start to believe, Lord, and everything you've called her to be, Lord. Lord Jesus, that she's already a good wife, that she's already a good mother, Lord. And Father God, and any, any thought that enters into her mind to make her think that she's not those things, we cast those the lying spirits and those lying thoughts in the name of Jesus, Father God, and give her a sound, sound mind in every aspect of her life, that she doesn't have to worry about anything, Father, because I know that she's used to figuring things out. She's used to being in control of certain things. But Father God, I pray that she would trust you, Lord, regardless of what things look like, regardless if they make sense or not, Lord, help her, Lord. Help her in this, in Jesus' name. I pray you would develop her thoughts, develop her mind, more than ever, Lord, so she can keep getting visions and prophecies and dreams, Father God, as I believe you desiring to give her more of these things, Father God. In the name of Jesus, Father, I thank you for that. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Ain't nobody else asked for prayer. I guess everybody's mind is good and under control. Amen. Anybody else? And I know there's a lot of y'all that should have been asking for prayer, but if you didn't ask, no pressure. <laughs> I'll give you to the count of three. One, two. There we go. <laughs> I don't know why you guys get so shy and so scared to ask for prayer, man. Ask for prayer. Listen. When I gave my life to Jesus, I was at every altar call, whether the message had anything to do with me or not. I could tell the point my pastor had to tell me, bro, stop coming up here. <laughs> like, stop coming up here. You're asking for too much prayer. And I want you to start praying for people. There's nothing wrong with asking for prayer and get all the prayer you can get. You're not draining me. Trust me. I've, I know I know how to minister from my overflow and not from my cup. Don't worry about it. Father, we thank you for Leilani's life, Jesus. Lord, I pray you would uproot that jealousy that goes on in her mind. And I know where that jealousy is coming from, Father. And Father, you she knows what it is as well. She doesn't need to, she doesn't need to be jealous in relationships. She doesn't need to be jealous of what someone may have that maybe she thought belonged to her or that she deserved, Father God. 
I pray that she will surrender that in the name of Jesus, Father God. Cast out that spirit of envy and jealousy, Father God, that goes on in her mind. And Father God, you see what she's trying to do, Lord. You see what the relationship she's battling to end and struggling, and she's working towards it, Father God. Father God, and I know the jealousy is the thing that's trying to keep her there, Father. We ask that you would deliver her from envy and jealousy, that she would trust and be secure in what you have and not what anyone can take. Because if they can take it, it was never ours. And we thank you, Jesus, that people can, can take things, Father God, but guess what? Nobody can take what you've given us, what you have for us, Lord, unless we gave it up, Father. So we thank you for that. Give her strength, give her peace, give her joy, and knowing Father God, she doesn't need to be jealous of what anyone can have or anyone can take, Father God, because what you have for her, nobody can take and nobody can have because it has Leilani's name written all over it. So the Lord is saying, don't worry about any of those things because what he has for you, your name's written all over it. And you might have detoured yourself a little bit, but you're headed, if, you're, if you follow him, you're heading in the right direction and nobody can take and have so whatever anyone has taken or anyone has, don't worry about that. That wasn't meant for you. Father, so we thank you. We pray for our sister, Terry, Lord Jesus. Give her a sound mind, Father God, because I know the enemy's been attacking her mind a lot, Lord Jesus. I can feel it in my spirit. In Jesus' name, deliver her from anxiety right now, Lord. Anxious thoughts about her future fearful thoughts about the future, the unknowns of her future that she's worried and, and it overwhelms her that she doesn't know where her life is going to go. Father, deliver her from that, that she'll start to believe what your word says for her, Father, that you have good plans for her, that you have good things for her life. If she chooses to obey you and live for you, Father God, and if her life is surrendered in your hands, then she doesn't need to worry about nothing. And Jesus is saying, if he's on the ship, you don't need to fear no storm that you because you're in a storm right now in your life. You're in a storm. But don't don't fear anything because Jesus is on the ship with you. You don't need to fear the storm when Jesus is on the ship. And we thank you for that in her life. Strengthen her. Renew her right now in Jesus name. Give her peace right now, Lord. Give her peace. Lift up off all the weight, all the stress, all the worry, all the anxiety. Deliver her right now, Lord. And give her joy knowing, give her that joy knowing that you love her. And Father God, and no matter what's going on in her life, Lord, it's not over yet. We thank you for that in Jesus' name. We also pray, Lord, for Carlos needs prayer because I tend to have lustful thoughts towards women and inches to away in my heart. I feel it and it's a dirty feeling. It makes me want to take a cold shower afterwards. Father, we pray, deliver him, Father God, in Jesus' name. Deliver him from every unclean spirit every Jezebel spirit, every spirit of sexual immorality and lust out in Jesus' name. I rebuke you by the authority of Jesus right now. I feel the presence of God on this one. I command every wicked and unclean spirit, every devil, every demon that has had him a slave, because I see you right now as a slave, a slave to this. You've been a slave for this for a long time, but in Jesus' name, Free him, Father God, from his Egypt, because this sin, the Lord is telling me, this sin has kept you in a Egypt in your life. You've been a slave for so long, and because you're a slave, you're limited in your life, and you've been desiring not to be limited. But God is saying, Carlos, you got to put in the work. You got to get up. You got you to gotta start moving. And guess what? And when he does, when you start moving, that Red Sea will get split open, and he'll take you into your promised land. But if you don't, if you don't start moving and start doing your part, it, it's not going to happen. But I pray right now, Lord, that you will strengthen him. So, Father, he enter his promised land and he could be delivered from his Pharaoh. He could be delivered from his Egypt. Father God, that he doesn't need to be a slave to lust. Father God, that Father God, when his mind tells him to look at this girl and to think this thing or do that, Father God, that he will say no. I submit my thoughts to Jesus. I will think about Jesus. I will love Jesus. And Satan, I rebuke you for even making me try to look in lust. Deliver him from that and strengthen him and give him a sound mind 
So the shame, because that's where the enemy's been using it to shame you, to keep you away, to keep you not getting involved, to keep you not getting busy for the things of God. Because these, these every time you fall in that area, you condemn yourself. But God is not condemning you. He's calling you to be delivered and secure. So, Father, deliver him and secure his mind, Lord. And from this day that he do his part, help him do his part so he can go from deliverance to dominion in Jesus' name. We thank you for Sally and Lewis. We thank you, Jesus, that you would give both of them a sound mind, that this situation with their child that they're about to have, Lord Jesus, that the enemy is going to make them think, how are you going to do it with this business? How are you going to do it when you're overwhelmed? How are you going to take care of it if you're tired? How is the business going to flow? All these negative thoughts. Father, we cast them down in Jesus' name. All these question marks and doubts that the enemy is trying to put about their future, about their children, and about their business, about their finances, we rebuke these thoughts in Jesus' name. And we pray right now that you would give both of them a sound mind, Father, and that they will start putting in their, their, their due diligence to serve you and they love you. Because, Father, your word, this is a promise that if we seek your kingdom, if we seek you first above all things, you will add all these things onto us that you desire for our life. And I pray, Lord, give them, give them the strength and the desire to put you first and seek after you first in all things. And then when they see that, they'll know that everything is going to be all right. Father, we thank you for that. We thank you for Freddie. Your prayer to keep my mind sound. Lots of progress has been done and always to be built in every aspect of my life. Give me wisdom to deal with my personal relationships. Father, we thank you for that. We thank you, Lord Jesus, for Freddie. We thank you, Lord, for what you're doing in his life and what you're going to continue to do in his life, Father. Continue to secure his mind. Lord, I know his mind has already been delivered. And I pray, Lord Jesus, that he continues to secure it. Continue to secure it. I just hear the word, just continue to secure it. You've already been delivered. You just need to maintain that secure. Don't let, don't drop your guard for nothing. The Lord is saying, do not drop your guard for nothing. Father God, because they know it's it's locked up and you've been delivered. They're waiting for an opportunity for you to be unsecured. But we thank you, Jesus, for his mind that is secured and that he will maintain it. Father God, in Jesus' name, strengthen him, help him, and bless him, and help him and guide him on how to maintain and what he needs to do in these relationships, Father God, that he's been asking your help for for a long time. We bless him in Jesus' name. We thank you for everything, Lord. We thank you for this Bible study. We end this and any of those who did not ask for prayer, Lord, and needed the prayer, Lord, I pray that you would bless them and that you would help them next time, Lord, to be able to ask for prayer and that you would give them humility. And maybe maybe they weren't able to write it, Father God. We bless them anyways. And we just thank you, Father. Help us, Lord, to have your mind in Jesus' name. And Satan, we punish you. <laughs> By the authority of Christ Jesus for everything you've been trying to do, what we've allowed you to do. But guess what? We are more than conquerors in Jesus Christ. Thank you, Lord. Amen and amen. Amen, guys. If you guys have got any tithes and offerings, don't forget my wife just posted the cash app and the sale. And that is the Discord link. If you guys are not on the Discord, you can always bless. The reason why we pick up tithes and offerings is that way we have funds to be able to do what we do and eventually have our own place. Amen. So if you guys got tags or offerings, you guys can always send it there. We have service this Sunday, 1030 at the clubhouse. So invite somebody. Let somebody know about Jesus. Don't show up there by yourself. Let that be your mission for the rest of the week. Bring somebody with you. Let somebody know about what Jesus is doing and how God can save them and how God can bless them. And if you know somebody with mental health issues, please bring them. <laughs> Please bring them so they can be delivered, so they can be healed, and so they can have a sound mind and see that there is hope for their life in Jesus. And um, Freddie said, get there on time. Yes, please get on time. If we can be on time for work, we can be on time for everything else. Well, why is it that we struggle to be on time for church? That, to me, shows a lack of respect for Jesus. We need to start showing reverence for Jesus, be on time. Amen. And pray for my sister. I pray that she comes through. Yes, let's pray for Josh's sister. And all those, I know a lot of you guys have family members and friends that you desire for them to come to church. Well, let's pray. Let's raise up as a church and say, Satan, I'm going to punish you for keeping my family away from Jesus. They'll be there on Sunday. Let's believe it. Let's believe it. So we'll see you guys Sunday, 1030. I love you guys. God bless you guys. And continue to have that mind of Christ in Jesus' name.